Hey guys, it's Kim here and welcome to this year's top 5 games of 2014. For those of you who don't know, last year I sat down with several members of the Yogscast and talked to them about what their games of 2013 was, but 2013's dead, it's gone, it's over. Almost. So we're talking about 2014's games, because that's the year that comes after 2013. So to kick things off, I'll be talking to various members of the Yogs cast uh, for the next couple of weeks on my channel, but to kick things off, I'm going to talk about my games of 2014. So in at number five straight away, I'm actually going to say something you probably don't expect or remember, and that is the Yorg. So it's an indie game, a um, very simple game. It was literally kind of like a, almost like a story generator, like you generate your own story. and. I loved it because I loved when, because uh, as you know, I got together pretty much everyone in the Yogscast cast to play it and it was awesome. It was awesome how many times we played it and the story came out differently and I loved how random some of the scenarios got, like, you know, uh, teaching the king uh, sexy tricks with his wife and uh, getting turned into a vampire and, you know, hanging out with orphan kids and stuff like that and how that would affect the coming days of you fighting the Yorg and surviving the Yorg and then that kind of last week of how are we going to survive this or you know who should take what role based on our stats and stuff like that and I think the thing that I loved the most was kind of how everyone in the Yogs cast really got into it um um, I mean, because everyone here loves their kind of like D&D, their role playing and and like especially like Simon and Lewis like really got into their characters and of course Trot was a fabulous narrator, probably my favourite one. The Yahook devoured Houses Hall! I, I think really the best bit of the whole thing was the fact that Sips ended up being a vampire overlord and he pretty much survived his round as the world leader and just turned everyone into vampires and had like a fountain full of blood and rich parties and stuff like that and I think if anyone was going to survive in such a grandiose fashion, it was definitely going to be Sips. But I think it just showed just how powerful and effective simple independent titles can be. You don't need to be a AAA title to kind of have that amazing gameplay experience or have those amazing moments. You can just be a simple point and click adventure or a story generator or a simple RPG just like that. And it's still just as effective in delivering those kind of really fun, memorable group experiences and, you know, your own story in your own quest. And a special mention I think as well for Broken Age, which was the um, double fine Tim Schafer kickstarted point and click. Played that in January and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I love point and click adventures um, and it was brilliant to see Tim Schafer kind of back on form and back to what, you know, what he does best essentially. I really love the art style of it. I love the kind of quirkiness of it. I love the knowingness of it. I cannot wait to see the second part of that. Uh, I think it's coming out in 2015 so I'll definitely be playing it on my channel, especially because they left it on such a massive cliffhanger. Um, so yeah, position number five for me is the Yorg with a special mention for Broken Age. So disregarding what I just said about uh, not needing to be a AAA title, my game number four of 2014 is Far Cry 4. Now I was looking forward to Far Cry 4 because I loved Far Cry 3. I loved the open world nature, I loved how you instantly just got given a grenade launcher and it was like, yeah, go on, carry on. And it sort of had that far, uh, fallout feeling of like you can, there's the main quest there, you can go and do that, or you can just bum around liberating outposts, doing what you want and um, that's what I love. And Far Cry 4, I think, just just doesn't disappoint me. I, if I'm honest, I prefer the setting of Far Cry 4 to 3, but that's just because of my personal preference, because I love the East Asian influences, I love seeing Buddhas everywhere, I love, you know, the Himalayas, I think, was a really good place to set the game, because the Himalayas spans so many countries and continents. It allowed you to have so many influence, like Indian influence, Tibetan influence, Chinese influence. I'm playing it on PS4, so I know you PC purists will be like, oh, whatever. But it looks absolutely gorgeous. And that, aside from Alien Isolation, really have impressed me this year on console with how they look. I was just like, oh my god, this is beautiful. And of course, I love the fact that 10 minutes of playing the game and I was shoved into the open world and I could do what I want and explore around. And I honestly spent two hours just hunting honey badgers. And I think that's what I love the most about Far Cry 4, is the random kind of moments where you'll just do something completely ridiculous and you're just like, that was ridiculous. I mean, oh my god, the other day I attacked an outpost with an elephant and I I, I screwed it up a little bit and um, I, I started dying so I jumped off the elephant to go and heal myself and take some cover and the elephant just went off and killed everyone. So while I was just like hidden behind some crates healing up, the elephant just went and murdered everyone and liberated the entire outpost for me and I was like, oh, okay. 
that, uh, so that was a thing. Oh yeah, and there was a, this time where I set one of the rabid dogs on fire and he ran into an outpost into a flaming barrel and exploded it and killed about five people clustered around the barrel. Oh my god, that had me in hysterics for ages. Um, and of course, Pagan Min, I'm loving Pagan Min. He's not as visible as Vas from um, Far Cry 3, which I think is a real shame because I think he's a brilliant character. I think Troy Baker I mean, is just absolutely fantastic as him. I love the phone calls I get from him, I love his personality. So Far Cry 4, absolutely loving it, absolutely loving the chaos I'm causing. And it's definitely my game where I just go home and I turn it on for 10 minutes, liberate an outpost or just run around, like just taking in the scenery or just shoot grenade launchers at people. And that's my kind of like, my stress relief for the night. So yeah, loving it. In at number three is a game I played quite a lot earlier this year actually, but for me, very nearly killed me, and that is Outlast. Um, I absolutely loved Outlast. I, I think, you know, you'll get that. It surprised me, because I love horror games, I love horror films, I love horror literature, I read and consume so much horror stuff that I, I'm its biggest lover, but also its biggest critic. I see so many films, because I'll watch anything, and I see so many films where I'm just like, yeah, okay, so this is when I go ghost turn, this is gonna be the jump scare, this is gonna be the story, this is gonna be the twist, and I know, I know exactly what's gonna happen in it, and I feel that way with games recently. However, this year I think we've had three absolute gems in the horror gaming division that have honestly surprised me to my core. One of them is the PT demo for Silent Hills. I was going to put that in my top five, but I'm, I'm going to wait until the full game's out because I think that's going to be my top five of 2015 if I survive it. But I think if you watch my videos for the PT demo with Hannah, I think you'll understand why I'm so enthusiastic for that. So I'm not going to waste my time here talking about it. So just head on over to my PT demo video. But Outlast surprised me because I liked that it was just a camera. So that riffed a bit off of Project Zero or Fatal Frame if you're American. So I like that you just had a camera you didn't have any weapons, you didn't have any defense, you, all you could do was run and hide. And I love the monsters in it, I love Billy, I, I love the inmates, I love the setting, and you know, the DLC, if, the more I think about it, I didn't enjoy the DLC as much, but that's because of the kind of route that it went down with um, the groom, and I, I really didn't like him. I appreciated what they did with him, and he was horrible and awful, but for me, I didn't like the kind of delving towards the genital mutilation and all that kind of area, I I found that really quite disturbing, which, you know, the devs were trying to do, obviously. I much prefer the actual game itself. It really worked. It scared me, and not just in a jump scare sort of way, but it the tension throughout the whole game really kind of... I always felt tense when I was playing it, because I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what we were going to see. I didn't know what was going to happen next. So yeah, I absolutely love that. I can't wait for the sequel, which I think is due out next year. I'm, I'm always intrigued by that kind of setting, because I think there's a lot you can do with it. And um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the devs have got next. Moving away from gloomy and scary, we're going to go completely to the other end of the spectrum and go for rainbow colours and fun and screaming and actually, yeah, there was actually a lot of screaming and insults and frustration in that. So we're going to talk about Mario Kart 8, which I've absolutely fallen in love with this year. I'm a huge Nintendo fan. I've always been a Nintendo girl all my life. My first proper console was a SNES with Mario Kart on the SNES. Um, and I love Mario Kart, but I always wonder, you know, are they going to keep up the formula? I mean, because, you know, this is like, you know, 10, 20 years of Mario Kart now. Um, you know, is it still going to be good? And Mario Kart 8 is fantastic. I absolutely love it. What I love about Nintendo is it has that thing of being casual, but also being really hardcore. So anyone can jump into it. You know, you can play it with your friends, your family, people who have never touched a console before, and they can just jump into it and, and play immediately. But if you want that challenge, if you want the hardcore, if you want the, you know, that real frustrating moment where you're really fighting for the, the, the first position, it has that. I love that, you know, there are those shortcuts that you can nip into and there's there's a real attention to detail on the tracks. Like if you kind of um, Google Easter eggs for Mario Kart 8, some uh, other people have put together some fantastic videos on Easter eggs in the Mario Kart tracks that I just blew my mind. Like the detail is astonishing. And I've had so much fun playing Mario Kart with everyone in the Yogg's cast. Remember I did that Mario Kart tournament and it was, it was a lot of fun, like kind of mixing everyone up and even the guys who absolutely sucked at it. 
trot and terps you know had fun with it and it was it was one of those real kind of get together on the couch and just like pick up a controller drop in drop out and as you can see with my recent Mario Kart videos um, with Duncan and Shin we had so much fun um, even though we were losing and we sucked like it was so much fun to play and yeah and I love the DLC it's the first ever DLC for Mario Kart ever and the new tracks the Legend of Zelda track Hyrule Circuit oh my god when I first played that I had what I call that magical game gaming moment where you're just like oh my god this is the best again the attention to detail changing coins into rupees changing the sound effects to all of Legend of uh, Link's sound effects having the master sword that you activate with the three switches like I just thought do you know what if anything I wanted more I want another Hyrule track I, I wish that track was actually a bit longer and you know it had a bit more into it because and the music oh my god when I heard the music I genuinely had goosebumps the first time I played it I cannot sing the praises of Mario Kart enough so Mario Kart 8 is number my, my second game of the year and now here we are at number one for my game of 2014 and it will come as no surprise to you that it is Alien Isolation. Now I was absolutely surprised by this game. I did my thing of I saw the first trailer, I heard about it and then I went, Do you know what, I'm not going to read any more about it, I'm not going to learn any more about it, I'm not going to watch any more about it, I just want to play it. I obviously had the worry that it was going to be like Colonial Marines. I think Colonial Marines was a total abomination and totally missed the point of Alien. And the point of Alien is that it's one alien and you have nothing against it, you know? I am a huge Alien fan. As you know, I'm a huge fan of Sigourney Weaver. I'm a huge fan of sci-fi. I, I love Alien 1 and 2. I think, you know, they are almost perfect in terms of movies, in, in terms of horror, in terms of thriller in terms of sci-fi. I love the worlds that were created. I love the technology that was created. I love the spaceships. I love that everything wasn't, you know, like the Star Trek vision of space. You know, it's all kind of beautifully immaculate and, you know, it's all bright colours and everything is very well made and everyone looks good and you know is wearing uniforms and stuff like that i love aliens grungy kind of ships that are sort of pieced together and and obviously it was made in the 1980s and so everything was kind of cobbled together with their version of what they thought the future was going to be so it's still like really retro computer monitors and keyboards and phones and stuff like that but i loved the kind of inventiveness of the set design and the prop design and here we have alien isolation that absolutely nailed that and I have not experienced an alien game that has absolutely nailed that look and feel of what alien is like just the save points having the phone on the side and it looked like a phone booth the keyboards doing the big chunky keys the stupid little wavy um, bird desk thing you know scattered around like it was perfect it was absolutely perfect the way it looked and off camera i had i spent so much time just exploring the station just wandering around uh, exploring the torrens before you left it at the beginning and just enjoying the environment and the sounds and the look and and all of it and then the alien itself was perfect i genuinely felt terrified throughout the entire game because there was no point at which i realized like w when i first met the alien i i panicked because here was an ai that i genuinely didn't know how to deal with i i couldn't predict it i couldn't tell what it was going to do and it was so quick and so fast and so good at hearing and knowing where you were that you know there was just no escape from it one mistake and you're gone one thing i loved was that as you started to kind of think that you could you'd learnt how to deal with the alien the devs start to mix things up so when you were trying to hear for it and listen for it which by the way is some of the best sound design i've ever experienced in a game but yeah when you were trying to hear for it they went okay now here's a level where all the alarms are going off you can't hear anything you can't hear where it is you can't do that trick and you're like why why have you done this to me? And because it's to keep you on your toes. You've learned that it can, you, you can listen for it and basically pinpoint where it is. So now they're going to take that away from you. And then you got to later levels, like in the server farm, where there was long stretches with no save points. And again, brilliant use of sa uh, sound design of having the beeping of the save point. So when you went through this huge stretch of no save point, and you were like, I can't lose all this progress because I will just cry. And then you hear that faint beep 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 and you're like oh my god i have to get there oh where is it where is it where is it and you're trying to localize onto that and you're trying to think can i make it can i make that last bit can i save it can i go to it 
and I thought the set design and the level design was brilliant and so exploitative and it kept you on your toes and then in the later game where they shrunk the size of those rooms and took away your hiding places so you literally just had to crouch and keep moving and crouch and keep moving and then there was the added threat that Alien learns you can't use your noisemakers you can't use your flares all the time because it learns what it's going to do and like there's just so much detail in the game that absolutely worked. The logs, I love the logs and finding out what happened to the people or what didn't happen to the people. And there was a lot of love and care and attention to detail put in that game. And I really appreciated it. For me, it reinvigorated the horror genre for me. And that nostalgia level where you went back to the original spaceship where the Nostromo was, where the uh, space jockey was, I, for me, going down into that egg room and seeing all the eggs there, it was unbelievable. I could not believe they'd done that. At this point in time of recording, I haven't played the DLC, but I do have plans to do it. That is incoming, and I cannot wait because it's going to be like Christmas, hearing all the old voices of the cast, hearing Sigourney Weaver, and... I think it's going to be absolutely fantastic. There's a really interesting discussion on my subreddit at the moment as to whether or not you guys have preferred Outlast or Alien Isolation. And it's a really interesting discussion that I forwarded on to the devs of Alien Isolation because I thought here is some amazing feedback, guys. And one comment I really enjoyed was someone saying they felt that my playthrough and my kind of experience of it was sort of like how Alien should be in the sense that when Ellen Ripley in the game, in the film, first encountered the alien, she was scared, she was vulnerable, she didn't know what to do, she didn't know how to come up against this hyper-intelligent predator. But towards the end of the film, she'd learnt, she'd buckled down, she was mentally strong, and she kind of tooled up and learnt how the alien works and came up against it and won, even though she was still terrified. And that's how I felt when I first met the alien, I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. I, I hid, I cut I cut it down because obviously you don't want to see this. I hid for a locker for 20 minutes and while I was freaking out because I was like, I don't know how to do this. But then I realized by the end of the game, I had learned how to deal with the alien, how to use the flamethrower, how to back away from it, how if you heard it behind you, you keep walking because there are chances that he's not quite round that corner yet and you can just make it round the corner and escape. I certainly didn't feel any less scared of the alien towards the end game, but I felt that I could at least deal with it and I could at least approach it and I could at least, you know, I was a little bit more equipped with how to read it and how to think where it had gone and, and what it was doing and what it was thinking. And I think for a game to deliver that experience is an astonishing feat. I, I can't think of another game that takes you on a journey and an experience like that and, and almost organically encourages you and teaches you to, to become better. I, I cannot speak highly enough. I think for a game to be able to do that, what more do you want? So there you go. Alien Isolation is my game of 2014. So thanks so much for joining me, guys. I'll be doing this with more members of the Yogscast. I've already talked to Duncan and Shin, and I've got plans with other members of the Yogscast, so keep an eye out for that. Let me know what your games of 2014 were in the comments below and, um, on, our, on, and on our Reddit thread as well. See you guys next time.